Well, Sami, thank you so much for being here with us. I have a first question for you, which is about India. India's vision of the world, India's grand strategy, the type of global order that India would like to see, if such a thing has been specified. But of course, India is going to be one of the central players in global affairs. It already is central to the Indo-Pacific and the region, but it will be central moving forward, perhaps even more so than it is today. So how does India view its environment and the world beyond? Is there such a thing as an Indian grand strategy? So Manuel, first of all, let me thank you for having me here. Indian grand strategy is as most grand strategies, a work in progress, do reflect uh, realities that um, countries need to grapple with. Uh, today, for example, um, India is more certain that its uh, decisions to not be part of blocks or camps or um, align themselves to political agendas of, of others uh, seems to be a reasonable one. Uh, it is important for India that uh, houses one-sixth of humanity, 16% of, of all humankind, uh, to put together a framework that serves this very large and young population mm -hmm. that caters to their um, immediate development requirements, that builds a future that will uh, respond to their aspirations and that seeks uh, uh, prosperity uh, which is prolific and uh, is inclusive. Now, in that sense, the India's uh, current and future course of uh, engagement with the world is going to be primarily based on three big um, impulses. The first will has to have to be uh, peace and stability. If we have to grow, if we have to put together everything that I've just mentioned, we, re we require uh, peace not only in our neighborhood but also um, uh, in the world. Because India's uh, appetite to engage with the world is growing exponentially. We are today at three and a half trillion dollars and uh, you know in less than a decade we are going to be hitting the 10 trillion dollar mark. Now, we will have footprint in Latin America. We have deep engagement with the EU already. Uh, Africa and India are going to grow together. Uh, East Asia and India are today uh, uh, linked in multiple, man in multiple ways. And of course, uh, US and Western Europe continue to dominate in terms of being our most important partners. So we are going to be invested in peace around the world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. any Indian grand strategy has to be centered around that particular phenomena. Sure. The second, of course, is that we are seeing two big shifts. The first shift that we are witnessing is from the fossil fuel world to a green energy world. And uh, uh, the green energy industrial complex that is going to mushroom is going to be uh, basically an Indian development. You know, we are going to be the first 5 trillion and then the next first 10 trillion dollar economy that would have powered itself on clean energy. You mm -hmm. know, we are less mm -hmm. than 2 tons per capita emissions and we are close to three and a half trillion dollars. Go back in history, find me a three and a half trillion dollar economy that would have a per capita emission this low. We are going to probably maintain the same profile at five, at 10, at 12, at 15. Mm -hmm. So the green transition forces India to think about a global architecture that allows access to material, uh, that allows access to components, that allows access to technologies that will continue to service this whole new green future that we are building together. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if oil dominated the grand strategies in the past, I think green energy and, and green supply chains are going to dominate the future thinking and India has to be uh, cognizant of that. And finally, the, the digitalization from, from the real to the virtual and to a virtual that has real world consequences. Mm -hmm. And again, it means that uh, tech diplomacy, uh, governance of tech, um, uh, technology that is safe, technology that is uh, that deconflicts rather than creates contests are all uh, questions that are going to be resolved not by an independent nation or an individual nation, but by a collective. We just saw the visit of, uh, of Xi Jinping to Moscow. Mm -hmm. You probably saw the clip mm -hmm. after the dinner of Xi Jinping and Putin speaking, saying we're seeing changes to the world order that we hadn't seen in 100 years and you and I are driving these. Uh, we didn't need the clip to be leaked because this was in the press release, in the wording of the press release. Uh, the same thrust, the same idea. This leads me to, to, to this reflection. Are we moving to a world of blocks? Are we moving to a world of a democratic, liberal, open bloc led by the United States, possibly uh, Europe, parts of Latin America, of the Global South, and another bloc led by China, by Russia, less democratic, less open? If we are, is the Ukraine war one of the pivotal uh, sort of moments that is consolidating these blocks. So that's a question on, on, on order. But if that world is emerging, where does India stand? Because this really, this world of blocks poses a huge challenge to the development agenda and the trade agenda, to the climate agenda, to the governance of technologies, because it depicts a world 
of blacks and whites. And it's going to be very difficult to build global governance uh, arrangements when two of the largest actors are leading two blocks that see the world in zero-sum terms. So, in fact, this depiction of a world of blocks I know is incendiary and is outrages the global south because it puts at risk all of these agendas. So, what you've just described as the three axes seem, in my mind, to be under severe threat if that world emerges. We are seeing tensions that would suggest that warriors from the last century uh, are back in business and they would like to carve up the world in easy digestible parts, uh, the good and the bad. Uh, but Kissinger, by the way, just said the second Cold War. So yeah, there's, there's almost like a labeling. No? Yeah, I mean, you know, Kissinger, he, he was there in the first one as well. So there you go. You have these Cold War warriors of the past who want a new Cold War for our current. They are likely to uh, push us in a certain direction of thinking as well as action. Uh, I don't think the Global South is going to be impressed by that. I don't think countries like India really care too much about Kissinger then and nor do they care about Kissinger now. The difference between India then and India now is just a few trillion dollars of GDP and a few trillion more that we will add to our GDP. So uh, if he was inconsequential when we took our decisions in the last century, for example, uh, support the folks in East Pakistan who wanted an independent country, uh, respond to the genocide that was underway, despite American pressure, despite Kissinger's uh, and, and Kissinger-style politics that was being thrown at us, um, perverse politics that was more convenient and more based on on, on, on chessboard decision-making rather than on people's lives and, 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 and human outcomes, you're going to see countries uh, re reject that. Uh, I, in fact, I, I've spent a week in Europe and I saw Europeans reject it. I was in, I was in Berlin at this big uh, round table of thinkers and I could see voices from across Europe were, uh, were mortified that they would need to choose between the US and China. They wanted US and China, not US or China. They want a China that behaves, we want it too. They want a China that is less belligerent, we want it too. They want a China that doesn't try to reshape borders and destroy the rules-based system that they had so carefully crafted. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Only they do. Because many in the Global South don't believe that the rules-based order was written by the Global South. Mm -hmm. And here China has a greater resonance, uh, has greater appeal uh, uh, with, with certain countries. Countries are not going to see Ukraine as a decision point. I had a very interesting graph I saw of the countries that have sanctioned Russia. If you look at the countries that have sanctioned Russia and the countries that got their first doses of vaccines, they're the same countries. The sure. global south is going to remember the three years of the pandemic. Sure. When, I, when vaccines were being thrown into trash, kin, trash bins in, in developed countries and not being sent to their uh, geography. And we've just seen also the AUKUS uh, agreement sort of announced. Uh, it's about the transfer of nuclear technology mm -hmm. and capability mm -hmm. to Australia, but also on missiles, on intelligence and a number of sort of uh, advanced technologies and others. Uh, we also have now the quarter arrangement at the government, at the heads of government mm -hmm. level, which we hadn't had uh, in the past. Um, what what do you think would be India's reaction to start off with, if China uh, behaved in the ways that these members are fearing that it will, say in the Taiwan Strait, right? If there was an invasion of Taiwan or a long-term blockade of um, Taiwan, Manuel, India or doesn't have to have a uh, have a scenario to understand China. We have 100,000 troops facing Chinese troops currently in the yeah. Himalayas. China is trying to change the map of Asia currently on our borders. Yeah. Europe has woken up to defend democracy very late. We've been defending democracy a little while earlier. When Europe was siding with the dictator in Pakistan and with the, with the Communist Party of China to counter the Soviet Union first and now Russia. We have been responding to China for a bit. Yeah. We know how Chinese behave. So there is no doubt in, our, in my mind the capabilities that we need to build to fend off Chinese muscularity to make sure China uh, behaves itself, to draw red lines, is important. And for that, whether it is AUKUS or Quad or any other arrangement that can enforce good behavior from Beijing is good for the world. A Beijing that behaves well is, a, is good for everyone because we have uh, a very strong economic actor in Beijing that is going to benefit not only uh, Europe, which it already does, but also Africa and, and Latin America and other parts of the world that still need to grow, develop and and, and climb the development ladder. But your hope is that this, this encouragement of good behavior is done through soft means, through harder means if necessary, but this doesn't lead to a world of blocks. So what is the difference between this discourse and the US discourse, right? Which is we're headed for a structural collision with China. Sometimes you have to read the Chinese playbook to understand how perhaps you need to deal with China. Mm -hmm. China found it absolutely fine and finds it absolutely uh, useful to have a very belligerent political uh, posture with Japan, for example and yet have Japan as their second largest trading partner. 
it has built hundreds of billions of dollars of trading relationship with china uh, with america while threatening america and its bases and positions in in the pacific uh, uh, and of course it is uh, aggressive with india even as it does uh, over 200 billion dollars of uh, trade with india i think we don't need to uh, find a we need to drop a european money chain mindset Everything is not black and white. There are greys, and the world we live in today is going to be more grey than ever. We are in the digital world, which is chrome. It's an age of chrome. Everything is grey. Let's find mm-hmm. peace in grey. You can be extremely tough, and you can build deterrence capabilities, and uh, you can build uh, military capabilities to enforce good behavior while having robust and strong trade and economic ties. China did it for 20 years or 25 years. I hope you're right, by the way, because uh, I mean this this world where there are no greys. It's a very painful world. It's one where cooperation is harder, it's very inflationary. We're going to rediscover what it means to have these supply chains broken uh, and undone. And that's a, that's a complicated world. Uh, let me ask you a final question. Where, where is Europe in the Indo-Pacific? So when you look at the world from Delhi and you try to understand all of these piece, pieces of the puzzle, uh, where are we? Are we relevant on the economic trade piece, on the security piece? Where would you like Europe to be? Do we need to pivot to Asia, try to build more constructive relationships in Asia, maybe try to water down this black or white approach uh, that our colleagues from uh, the other side of the Atlantic uh, seem to have? Where, where do we fit in all of this? Sitting in New Delhi, perhaps Europe is the single most consequential actor for Delhi. And I say this with all seriousness. Uh, I mentioned the green transitions, and I believe Europe is India's key partner in that. I mentioned uh, a, a digital future, and I believe the regulations for the future, the governance architecture of the future is going to be shaped by New Delhi and Brussels, because we will have to uh, moderate the, the mercantilist urges in, in Washington and the, 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 the authoritarian urges of China. We'll have to create the third way, where uh, countries have space and room to, to, to manage their digital futures in, in manners that are uh, uh, you know, consistent with their own cultures and, and, and constitutions. Uh, and I think that's a big partnership again. And finally, on peace and security, uh, EU uh, will have to work with countries such as India to ensure that we don't get pulled to the margins and into conflicts, but we uh, strengthen the center and hold it there. And I think, um, uh, of course, Ukraine is too close to home. Every European is passionate about it. Uh, and it, it, it's, you know, geography matters and it's, it's, sure. it, it's, it's on the borders. Uh, but we will have to rise above these and we'll have to find a way that uh, the most important ingredient of some success that we achieved in the last 70 years, which was a degree of stability and peace, can be uh, preserved and can be pursued in the future as well. Well, this is, you know, it's wonderful to have you here and to see this view because this is the view from the Global South and in particular from India, which is going to be a fundamental builder of this architecture. The Ukraine uh, issue is tough for Europeans, not just because it's very close, uh, but also because of the substance. And I think we've done maybe uh, not too co- good a job at describing this as a neo-colonial war of aggression um, and maybe linking it to this global order debate. This is the autocracy's attack. I, I think that's a much weaker argument, to mm-hmm. be quite frank, than an argument on international law, on territorial integrity, right. uh, on sovereignty, which I think would have resonated more with countries around the world that have been the victims of uh, colonial wars in the past. Uh, although. I think that was a high mountain to climb because of the history, both recent and longer term history uh, of Europe and the United States in different parts around the world. But this is a new uh, world order that we are entering. I think India is going to play a fundamental role and we're very grateful uh, that you're here to share with us your thoughts and your ideas uh, and your analysis of what India would want to see and will be a part of building. So thank you, Samit, for being here. Thank you, man. Wonderful to have you. Thank you so much.